Namaste and uh, good morning to people in India and uh, good evening to people in United States and wherever you are. Uh, welcome to the another session. Uh, this is uh, day 17 of Shankara Jayanti festival, uh, which we are uh, inaugurating it as a oneness festival uh, happening in uh, both parts of the world. And we have been fortunate to have many Swamis, many speakers, many Gurujis, many illumined persons who are shining light on Sankara and uh, his life, uh, his bhashyas, uh, his kritis. And there are many artists, musicians, dancers, all of them have been performing wonderful um, pieces for our benefit. So thank you for uh, tuning in. This is being simultaneously broadcast on YouTube, Facebook, and on Zoom sessions. If you are new to this, you are welcome to check on Advaita Academy channel on YouTube or Advaita Academy page on Facebook for sessions that you have missed. All of them are being posted within about 24 hour period. Uh, and please feel free to tune in and join for other sessions later. Today, we have the good fortune of uh, two wonderful um, sessions. One, Sri Vijay Kapoorji is going to speak about Sankara and his disciples. After that, we are going to have a video presentation called Samskruta Sangeetam, an ode to Sankara and his teachings by Srimati Bhavana Mohanasundaram from Chennai. These are the two things that we have planned in this particular session. We will first start with uh, Sri uh, Vijay Kapoorji. And Vijay Kapoorji has a master's in computer science from Berkeley and an MBA from University of Santa Clara. He worked for a very long time at Hewlett Packard. While he was uh, um, working in Hewlett Packard, uh, he was introduced to Vedanta by Swami Chinmayananda in 1973. And then he attended two and a half year course by Swami Dayananda uh, in uh, PRC uh, in uh, late 1970s. And he has been the co-founder of Arsha Vidya Gurukulam uh, in Salersburg, Pennsylvania. And he is the founder of Arsha Vidya Center in the Bay Area. He has been teaching uh, Vedanta for over 30 years in the Bay Area. Currently, he takes multiple sessions in a week and he has approximately 150 students who attend uh, in person and right now, thanks to coronavirus uh, on YouTube live. And uh, um, he is also co-founder of uh, Hindu Community Institute, which I had the good fortune of uh, working with him uh, in that uh, session. And in that uh, in wonderful initiative, and uh, I am looking forward to your talk, <laughs> Jaji. And uh, I'm looking forward to the perspectives that you bring on Sankara and his disciples. The floor is yours, and I will go on a video and audio mute. Unless there is a need, I will stay, and the floor is yours. Namaste. Thank you, Prasadji. Thank you so much for your introduction. Uh, namaste to all of you. I would like to start with a small prayer. So uh, if you can join me, if you know the prayer. Uh, Om Sahana Vavatu Sahana Bhunaktu Sahaviryam Karavavahai Tejasvina Vadhi Tamas Tuma Vitvisha Vahai E Om Shanti 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 I am uh, very privileged and uh, very happy to spend some time with you uh, talking about Adi Shankara and uh, his disciples. I was of course very fortunate as uh, Prasad Jesus said uh, to have been uh, with Swami Dayan and Saraswati uh, for three decades, uh, three and a half decades actually, starting in 1976. And uh, as part of that, living in an ashram with him from 79 to 82, 
where we studied the Prasthanatreya, uh, the main Upanishads, Bhagavad Gita, and the first four sutras of Brahma Sutra. Of Brahma Sutra. And besides that, um, an intensive study of Sanskritam, uh, Paniniya Sanskritam. So uh, I left my job and I'm very indebted to my wife and children to uh, come with me. And uh, it was a very uh, revealing experience for me. So in uh, this period of time, we got very acquainted with the style of Adi Shankara's teaching became very clear to us. It's some, uh, there's a very unique quality to it. And um, uh, you may be familiar with the characterization of his teaching, which is called Prasanna Gambhiryam. Gambhiryam means the, uh, the depth. And in fact, in some ways, seriousness. So Gambhira means deep or serious, and Gambhiriam is the quality of being deep or serious. But the seriousness is not a sad seriousness. It's not something bad has happened. It is Prasanna Gambhiriam. This is the beauty about learning about uh, Vedanta, is that yes, it's a lot of work, and it's, um, it's, you have to be very dedicated and so on. But while you are doing it, it is very pleasant. It's not as though the, uh, the, uh, the artha, the very result comes in at the end of that. As actually, there's a very beautiful uh, analogy to this. You know, suppose you are very hungry and um, you are starving, really. You, are, you have not had meal for a while and then you start to eat, it's not as though you will be happy only when you finished eating. The first roti that you eat, the very morsel of rice that you eat, gives you some happiness. The very process of eating also is very happy. And so this is exactly like the study of, uh, uh, of Vedanta. Um, Adi Shankara's style of Bhashya, I think must have been talked about a number of people. It is unique. There is something personal about it. And after a while, you feel like I can identify who is teaching this. His style is more like, this is why it is called Bhashya. So Bhashya means that it, is, it talks to you and talks to you after several thousand years. It's just a, it's a personal friend of yours. Anyway, now let us turn into the disciples of Shankara. Um, and uh, I would like to start with the word shishya. The word disciple in English doesn't give complete justice, but the word shishya, as you know, Sanskritam, is uh, there is no, no word that does not have a very precise meaning. That is the very nature of the language. And the word shishya is like that. What does shishya mean? So let's consider that. So what you find is that in any endeavor where some people are following you, like a class, there's going to be a variety of people who are interested in it. And uh, they like it. Um, but doesn't mean that everyone deserves to be there. So shishya means shiksha yogya. The yogyata is important. And so what that means is that uh, between the teacher and the student, there is a close relationship. They can almost talk to each other in the same language. I remember this one personal uh, experience that I'll never forget. I was uh, studying at UC Berkeley on my computer science, and I had a chance to do a, a small project with a, uh, with a very famous person by the name of Dr. Donald Glazer, who won the Nobel Prize for Bubble Chamber. I was very excited. Actually, I delayed my graduation by a quarter, by a semester, to study with him. And um, there was a, uh, some kind of a project that the electrical engineering people and the theoretical physics people were doing together. And so I asked Dr. Glazer one time, can I please attend your classes? And uh, this was not part of the project. So he kind of smiled at me and he says, okay, come, come. You know, I soon realized I was sitting there in a class of 30 people 
and really four or five of them were in tune with Dr. Glazer. They were asking him questions, nodding their heads, and the rest of us were kind of looking around, not knowing exactly what was happening. We were not shishyas. They were shishyas. So uh, Swami Dayanand once uh, told us that his knowledge is that uh, Adi Shankara had 14 shishyas, not just four. And so these 14 probably were more than that. But you know how the legend in uh, Vedic uh, uh, history is. It's not very firm. We are for some reason don't do a good job of recording historical facts. Um, I will just even uh, mention this, that when we talk about the four shishyas of Shankara, which I'll do in a minute, how the descriptions vary. In some cases, Sureshwaracharya is the Matapati of Shringeri, and other books say he is the Matapati of Dwaraka. Someone else is the Matapati of Shringeri. There is no unanimity. So we have to really see that in that sense. I think that the main thing is the the lexicon of their their uh, recorded history in terms of books. What thoughts they convey, that is really what we need to really learn about. Okay. So let's go on. Let us... Um, oh, one other thing I would like to do before I start on uh, describing the four shishyas, let me share with you a picture that was obtained by Swami Dayanandji from Chennai in 1980. And I've had it there in my possession. And it adorns the, men, the, the top of my puja sthanam. So I'm going to take this uh, and show you the picture, which was done by, um, I forget the name of the artist. I had it here somewhere. I think it's called, uh, Raja Pras anyway, I, I, I can't remember. Let me show you the picture and I'll point out. There is a reason for doing that. So come with me. So I'm not sure that you can see it completely because of the uh, reflection from the glass. But this is the famous picture. Oh yeah, his name was Srinivasa Rao. And uh, uh, this picture has, this is uh, the first of the Shishyas, Padmapadacharya. This is Totakacharya. Of course, this is Adi Shankara. You are familiar with that. This is Hastamalaka. And this is Sureshwaracharya. And what you will find is that the artist has uh, been true to the history. Hastamalaka is a boy Acharya, youngest. And uh, Sureshwaracharya is the oldest out of them. So uh, I just wanted to show you this picture. This is in my puja sthanam. Every morning as I do my puja uh, to the Acharyas, I also give my thanks to these four shishyas of uh, Shankara for blessing me with uh, clarity and continued uh, study and teaching and I'm very grateful for that. Okay, so let us now um, talk about the first Shishya uh, which I will go through in a clockwise fashion from the picture from left to right is Padma Padacharya. Now, Padmacharacharya was apparently held in high regard by his teacher. How do we know that? Because Adi Shankara asked him to write a commentary on his Bhashya to Brahma Sutra. This is a great honor. And uh, the legend has it that just as he had completed it, one jealous uncle destroyed the whole manuscript. And of course, he was very crestfallen. 
and uh, he had already started to uh, recite his commentary on Adi Shankara's Bhashya. And the legend has it that Adi Shankara remembered most of the of the first uh, section. And so together they recreated a document which did not cover the entire Brahma Sutra, but the first four sutras of Brahma Sutra. And this is called Panchapadika. They apparently had five chapters. It's called Panchapadika. So this is the first thing that Adi Shankara spoke very highly, not spoke, but thought very highly of him, number one. The second important thing about Padma Padacharya is that he, as part of this commentary, talked about a concept of Advaita Vedanta, which is very important up to this day, and I will discuss it a little bit later. If time permits, I can go into more detail on it. But I want to wait discussing it until I also cover Sureshwar Acharya, because the two of them are close to uh, agreeing. They are almost in complete agreement with what this is. This is called Vivarna, the, which is now called the Vivarna school of thought. And uh, there are so many different commentaries on Padma Padacharya's uh, commentary on the Bhashya, all having to do with the explanation of Vivarna. So this is called the Vivarna school. So the second reason why Padma Padacharya Ji is so famous for is that he is the author and the father, you may say, of the Vivarna school, which is very close to Adi Shankara's teaching. And at this point, I can say that there was an alternate school of thought written by Vachaspati Mishra, also on the first four Sutra Bhashya of Shankara. But his interpretation was slightly different. This is called Bhamati. So the Bhamati school and the Vivarna school had a small difference. It is not a major difference. For most part, they all agree exactly what the process is of gaining moksha. But how exactly that happens is slightly different and it can make a big difference in the way people look at it. So I won't talk much about Bahamati, but towards the end, I will discuss what are the differences between Vivarna and Bahamati. Okay. So this is, uh, I just want to give you a quick uh, uh, introduction to each one of them. And so this is uh, about Padma Padacharya. The second uh, Acharya is Totak Acharya. And um, our history on these uh, uh, Mahatmas is very sparse anyway, but it is especially sparse in the case of Totak Acharya. And uh, there is a, uh, I would like to reference a interesting book uh, which has been in my possessions uh, since uh, the time I went to the ashram. And uh, this was published in 1968. I'll hold it up. It's called Preceptors of Advaita. And it was written um, by the Kanchi Kamakoti Shankara Mandir in Sikandrabad, published in 1968. I would assume that it is still uh, available. What is remarkable about this book is that it talks about 61 major teachers of Advaita Vedanta over the history. And part of that, of course, are the four shishyas. And also each description of each of the 61 description is written by an expert who's not the same as others. They know the people very well. And so I borrowed a lot from, uh, from this writing. So in terms of Totakacharya, there is a, um, um, a write-up by Sri Rajagopala Shastri. And he writes that the legend has it that um, 
Totrakacharya was known as Giri in his previous life, in his previous ashrama. Giri was a very interesting person in that he was not attending the classes of Adi Shankara religiously. He would miss classes, but he would more than make it up by his close loyalty to Adi Shankara. He would be there in his room asking, what can I do? Washing his clothes, bringing some food for him. And uh, if it means he has to miss, it, uh, miss some classes, so be it. Now the other shishyas of Adi Shankara didn't think that this was a very wise thing to do. He said, let somebody else wash his clothes. We are students and we should really be studying. And in fact, they looked upon him rather contemptuously. And so legend has it that one time uh, there was a class starting. Everybody was present, including the guru. He was also ready. And um, Giri was not there. So everyone uh, got impatient and said, uh, let us start, sir. So Adi Shankara said, uh, let us wait for Giri. So I don't know which one, but one of the acharyas said, Giri misses a lot of classes, sir. It doesn't matter. He did. It doesn't really matter very much. Let's just go on. Adi Shankara would have none of it. He waited for Giri to come. And so this was part of the legend. Now, what happened was that uh, in, in, uh, in one time, Giri announced that he has composed a eight verses of a prayer to Shankara in the Totaka, um, in the Totaka style, the Totaka meter. The meter. I don't know exactly what the Totaka meter is, uh, but he composed it in the Totaka meter. And um, when he did that, and the the ending of each one of these um, uh, couplets is with Bhava Shankara Deshika Mesharanam. Bhava Shankara Deshika Mesharanam. My salutations to my teacher. And it's not that, but the subtlety of the thought, the completeness of the thought surprised everybody. Here's this person who did not even attend classes. How could he do this? And it goes to show that the very classical definition that you have to go through, you know, Kena Upanishad, then Kato Upanishad, then Taitriya Upanishad, and then etc., etc., then you study this, Bhagavad Gita, may not be necessary. Of course, what it means is that he was so close to the teacher that they must have had dialogues, he must have had questions, and uh, Shankara must have answered it because certainly the clarity of his thought was shown. This changed the perception of Giri completely. Everybody thought, my goodness, we really mis, uh, misjudged him. And not only that, but uh, later on, Totakacharya by that time was known as by his, uh, uh, his sannyasa name, composed a book of 179 verses, which is called Shruti Sara Samuddharanam. And this is a treatise which has a very high standing in the history of Advaita Vedanta. And once again, we were very fortunate that we got a copy of this. I'll hold it up for you. This is called Shruti Sara Samuddharanam. Samuddharanam means, dharanam means to hold. Samuddharanam, uddharanam means to hold up like you are showing something. And so this, he was not shy of showing the, the precepts of Advaita Vedanta to everybody. 
and uh, uh, there was a uh, uh, commentary on this by one Satchidananda Yogi and a very detailed commentary. And I saw that in my notes that I went through this in the year 2003. It took me 20 years. For 20 years, I did not study, but finally came to it. And I have gone through this book. I don't remember much of it, but if it was recommended by my guru, then I hold it in very high regard. So this was Tortakacharya who surprised everybody in the way he mastered the knowledge of Vedanta. Let us see how we are in verse of time. It's 5.56 o'clock. I think we are running a little slow. So I'll speed up. The third um, Acharya is Hastamalak Acharya. And again, a very interesting story. Hastamalaka was a boy living in a village and his father was uh, a very wealthy person in the village. And um, um, apparently the boy was not well. He was a weak person. Uh, he didn't eat well, didn't play with the other people. And his father was very disappointed in the way this boy was being brought up. So one time Adi Shankara had visited the village for some talks and so this, his father, uh, what was his name? Anyway, it doesn't matter. So he approached him and Prabhakara, sorry, Prabhakara approached uh, Adi Shankara and said, sir, I need help because there's something wrong with the boy. And uh, so Adi Shankara said, please, uh, please bring him in. So the boy came in and did an Ashtanga yoga Ashtanga Pranama, sorry, not Ashtanga Yoga, but Ashtanga Pranama, and uh, would not get up. He was lying prone on the ground. So Shankara lifted him up with the shoulder and asked him, who are you? Why do you behave as though you don't care? And the legend has it that the boy said, may I, sir, read a poem that I have written for you? Shankara said, yes, of course. And so he composed, he, not, he, he read out a previously composed called Hasta Malakiya. I can't pronounce it. Hasta Malaka Stotra. This was, an, um, and just like in the uh, Totaka Ashtakam, this was an amazing thing. And apparently this is the only thing that he did. He didn't write any uh, other com commentaries and so on. You know, and this shows the fact that people that are very clear about the subject matter, uh, there's a very popular term for it called realized souls. Swami Dhananda, Swami Dhananda never uses that word and I don't either. This means the very clarity of the knowledge is, uh, is, the, is the moksha purusha, jivan mukti. And... Uh, this Jeevan Mukta come in many styles. It doesn't mean that everybody has to teach. It doesn't mean everybody has to really go out and, uh, and, and become popular and so on and so forth. They can be sitting in some cave, as you know this very well. Personally, I'm very fortunate and very thankful to Swami Chinmananji and Swami Dayananji for not only understanding the subject matter so clearly, but also communicating it to the general public. I would never have been introduced without them. And so anyway, there are different styles. Hasta Malaka, and his name of course says, clarity of vision. Haste Amalakam Yasya, the one, who's, uh, one who has the, the Vidya, the clarity of the Vidya, as clear as a berry in their hand. This is a confirmation of uh, how uh, Adi Shankara viewed him. And so, now one, one thing before we go on to Sureshwar Acharya is that people say, you know, Hastamalika, as a 13-year-old boy, before he composed the Hastamalika Stotram, never really had any instructions. Now, isn't that contrary to what 
the Advaita Vedanta says that you have to have a living guru and you have to study with him, otherwise you cannot really gain this knowledge. The answer is yes, but not necessarily in this life. How are we to say that it was not done in the previous life? We have a beautiful example in Ramana Maharshi in the last hundred years. He was in a very similar situation. He was a young boy, I think 12 or 13, and seemed to be disinterested in things. You know what reminds us of uh, the great Albert Einstein? I regard him very highly. And so if you read his biography, he was very similar. He was just not a good student at all. He would not score well. His parents were worried about him. But look at his vision, look at his mind, the subtlety of to completely reject the uh, Newtonian model at that time required an extraordinary vision. So the answer with the uh, Hasta Malika also is, yes, it's possible, and, but not necessarily in this life. It must have been done in the previous life. Okay, so now we come to the last Acharya uh, before my time runs out and which is uh, Sri Sureshwar Acharya. I think that the uh, Mahatmas and scholars and the history would say that out of all of the uh, Acharyas who were Shishyas of Adi Shankara, Sureshwar Acharya was by far held in the highest esteem. In fact, there are a number of scholars, Madhusudana Saraswati being one of them, highly regarded the teacher of his own. He places Sureshwara on the same level as Vedavyasa and Adi Shankara. Even though he was a student of, uh, of Adi Shankara, but the, the quantity and the quality of his writings make him into a unique teacher in the annals of Advaita Vedanta. And again, there is no agreement on the history of how this happened. But if you look at um, um, the writings of, uh, uh, of in the Shankara Dig Vijaya, um, which uh, uh, has been done by uh, by a number of, of, of people, uh, and including Digvijaya, the understanding is that he in fact was Mandana Mishra, who was a very ardent proponent of Purva Mimamsa. So Purva Mimamsa, as you know, is that part of the Veda where karma is prominent. And you can even include the Upasana as part of that. So as you know, Vedas has three sections to it. Karma, Karma Kanda, Upasana Kanda, and Jnana Kanda. And so Karma and Upasana are called Purva Mimamsa. And Advaita Vedanta is the Uttara Mimamsa. So apparently Mandana Mishra was an expert in Purva Mimamsa. And legend has it that he and Adi Shankara were, were involved in a very prolonged debate that went over several days. And of course, they are, uh, these are people who are scholars, but they don't have a lot of ego. Scholarship means once you understand something, once you believe in something, then you let your 
understanding, speak for yourself. You don't have to have any special ego that I am the best, no one can do this, that or the other. As it, why am I saying this? Because at the end of the debate, he prostrated in front of Adi Shankara and said, my God, I was wrong, you are right. And that, uh, and you know, basically what it really means is that, uh, this is what is said in the Bhagavad Gita also, that the Karma Kanda and the Upasana Kanda is merely preparation for Jnana Kanda. It is not an independent competitor to Jnana Kanda. They are not separate paths. It is the first phase of the overall path. And Sureshwar Acharya understood this. Why uh, Swami Vidyaranya, who wrote the Shankara Digvijaya, thinks this is the right legend is because his depth of understanding of karma and its limitation is unmatched. In fact, he wrote uh, this very famous Siddhi Grantha called Naishkarmya Siddhi. And in there, no one has given this kind of point-by-point uh, point refusal. So Swami Vidyaranya feels that he must have had a great deal of respect for Karmakanda before he shifted over. And I think that's a very good argument to say that. Anyway, um, Sureshwaracharya went on to write in addition to... Um, the Naishkarmya Siddhi, he also wrote some, uh, some commentary. For example, he wrote the commentary on Dakshinamurti Stotram called Manasa Ullasa. And I was very fortunate to have taught this to my students. We just finished this about a couple of months back. And we went through uh, Sureshwacharya Ji's Manasa Ullasa, which is a commentary on the 10 verses of Dakshinamurti Stotram. So that just uh, is, I'm somewhat familiar with his style of writing and so on. And uh, in there also, he, he, um, he uh, takes apart uh, the other schools of thought, like Buddhism, Jainism, and uh, Sankhya, and Yoga, and all, all of them very well. And so um, he was an independent writer on his own, but he was also very devoted to his guru. Now, he wrote, he's called Vartikakara. He's famous for being Vartikakara. And as you know, Vartika, if you just a quick introduction to the various styles of, uh, and so one of them is called Karika. And there's only one Karika in the entire uh, annal of uh, Vedanta, which is written by Gaudapada Ji's, who's the Paramaguru of Shankara. Shankara's guru is Govinda Padacharya, and Govinda Padacharya's guru is Gauda Padacharya. And he wrote this book called, this text called uh, Karika on the Mandukya Upanishad. And once again, I'm very fortunate to be currently teaching the Karika to our students. We are almost done. We've been doing it for two years. And I think that we are just about uh, done with about half of Alata Shantik Prakarana. And so, uh, marvelous book. And then um, comes Taitriya Upanishad. And so he wrote a commentary on Vartika. So I, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't fully finish that. So you have Vartika, you have the Bhashya that you're familiar with, you have Vartika. And what Vartika is, is an independent work on a specific topic in verse form. And Sureshwacharya is called the Vartikakara because his Vartikas are amazing. And in following the footsteps of his teacher, uh, now Shankara's Shakha, they're both Yajurveda um, uh, disciples of Yajurveda, but the Shakhas are different. In um, Adi Shankara's case, the Shakha is Taitirya Shakha. And in Sureshwara's uh, 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 shakha is called Kanva shakha. Now, Taitriya Upanishad comes from, it comes in the Taitriya shakha. And so when Shankara wrote the Bhashya on Taitriya, 
he must have asked or Sureshwara volunteered, we don't know. But, Vol but Sureshwara wrote a commentary on the Taitriya Upanishad um, called Vartika on Taitriya Upanishad. 1000 verses, voluminous. Then, then he also thought that I would write it on his own shakha, which is Brihad Aranyaka Upanishad. Now, the scholars all feel that the Brihad Aranyaka Upanishad is perhaps the greatest Upanishad. Yeah, differences of, you know, some people say Mandukya is the one uh, in terms of the totality of uh, all the topics, Yagyamulkya's uh, teaching to Maitri and so on, Brihadaranika is supposed to be very well done. One thing they all agree on is that Adi Shankara's Bhashya on the Brihadaranika Upanishad is the greatest. He is the clearest and more complete than any of the other Bhashya. And in fact, so much so that before commencing the Bhashya on Brihadaranika Upanishad, Adi Shankara wrote an introduction to the Bhashya itself. It's called Sambandha Bhashya. Sureshwaracharya wrote two Vartikas, one on the Sambandha Bhashya and one on the main Bhashya. The Sambandha Bhashya itself is 1000 verses. And the main Bhashya is 10 times the size of that. It's something like 10,000 verses. I'll show you, uh, there, is a, uh, there is a four volume set, uh, which is called Brihad Aranika Vartika Sara. It's not even the complete uh, Vartika, it is just the Sara. And this is one of, look at the thickness of this book. There are, this is in uh, Hindi, uh, which is my Matra Bhasha. And um, I'm very indebted to Swami Maheshanandji, who is also Hindi speaking, uh, to really clarify. Uh, in fact, my Sanskrit has become not as good because his, his Hindi is all highly Sanskritized Hindi. And once I got to under understand that, this is all I'm following. So anyway, the Brihadaranika Upanishad Bhashyam and the Vartika on them is the last word. So for this reason, uh, the uh, Sureshracharya is held in very high regard. So in two more minutes, let me now complete what I had started to talk about, which is the Vivarna school and the Bhamati school. What are the differences? The differences are that in the Vivarna school, and by the way, before I say that, Sureshwaracharya follows the Vivarna school of Padmapadacharya. So the two of them are very, very close together each on that. In the Vivarna school says that the main thing everyone has to do in order to be very clear about moksha is to do shravanam and mananam. So this is what is called angi. Angi means the main stem. Yes, nididhyasanam is important because you need to focus on things. Like for example, the sun cannot burn a piece of paper, but if focused sun can burn a piece of paper. So Niti Dhyasanam is a focused study on Aham Brahmasmi. But the general teaching it comes from the sun. The light comes from the heat, comes from the sun, not from the, from the piece of glass. The piece of glass is just a sadhana for bringing the sun to focus. So therefore, the more important thing is Shravanam and Mananam. Nidhi Dhyasanam is merely a way of expressing Shravanam and Mananam. And if you're not clear about it, please go back and review the Shravanam and Mananam again. That uh, Sakshi is a Sangoham. If it's not clear to you, please study again. It's not as though you'll discover this in, in meditation. The Bhamati school, 
however, on the other side feels that Shavana and Mananam is okay, that is good. But really, the more you meditate, the clearer you will get. So these are the differences between these two schools. And uh, our Sampradaya of Swami Dayananji and his teachers and so on follows the Vivarna school. Meditation is important, but you better be very clear about the the essence of the teaching, which is Shravanam and Mananam. With that, I am finished. I'll just say a small prayer. Asatoma Sadgamaya Tamasoma Jyotir Gamaya Nityurma Amritam Gamaya Om Purnamadav Purnamidam Purnat Purnamudachyate Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnameva Vashishyate Om Shanti 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 Harihi Om Shri Kripyo Namaha Harihi Om Namaste to all. Thank you. What a wonderful, calming and clear thoughtful and uh, excellent uh, thank you discourse. thank you so much Deji. Uh, i'm uh, really you know heart warmed by that and there are wonderful comments about uh, uh, you it, you know some people say it is very very special and uh, then there are a couple of questions sure uh, you know one question from vijay mahadevan is that how do we reason about past lives, you know, uh, theory. I speak of it as a theory because it sounds very mystical to think about multiple lives and hard to conceptualize and understand at intellectual level. Do you have any thoughts on that? Sure. So let me ask uh, this question. Do you know how a small baby bird learns to fly? Have you seen the parents of the baby bird teaching him how to fly? How did he learn that? How did a baby learn to cry when it is uncomfortable? Why doesn't it start laughing? Because it knows from the previous birth that discomfort is not good. I better make some noise about it. I'm wet. Please change my diaper. Oh, I'm hungry. I need my mother's milk. So there is a continuation of life. It doesn't come out suddenly uh, for that. So really, it's, it is not an intellectual uh, uh, wrestling match or anything. It is just logic. And of course, you can keep on uh, developing it. We can have a lot of talks about this. So people are born with a silver spoon in their mouth. People are born with coronavirus in them before they are born. Is this God in unjust? He's just going to say, I'm going to punish, punish, you know, punish this person. No, it is all previous life, the karmas, the continuation of it. So that would be my answer. Thank you, uh, Vijay. There is uh, another question is, uh, from Shamala Raichira. Ch uh, your talk gives a lot of clarity. So if I understand correctly, Purva Mimamsa is a Kramakanda and Uttara Mimamsa is Advaita Kanda. If, so if that is the case, is Purva Mimamsa the first step towards Uttara Mimamsa? Can you clarify whether I, what I understand? Yes, absolutely. Is absolutely, absolutely. So uh, Purva Mimamsa is very important. So this is all clarified so well in the Bhagavad Gita, where it says that, uh, you know, this is very interesting. I'll just turn it around. So Arjuna, uh, who is, uh, is having a... Uh, uh, he's having a mental breakdown, emotional breakdown in front of Krishna and says, I'm not going to fight, not going to fight. 
So Krishna says, what? Why? What happened to you? He says, you know what? You've been teaching me that uh, Advaita Vedanta, that I should be doing meditation and Rishikesh. I think all of this is just not good, killing people and so on. I'm just going to go meditate in Rishikesh. <laughs> Krishna smiles at him and says, not so fast, buddy. <laughs> so he says, why not? Why can't I just do that? Krishna says, here's what will happen. You go to Rishikesh, the first day you're making a hut and you're saying, oh God, I'm so happy. I'm not fighting it in the Kurukshetra and so on. Within a week, you will say, I wonder how that war is going. He'll ask somebody, is there some Times of India report about how the war is going? They'll say, but we have no idea. You will go crazy because your interest is not yet natural to you. So the Karma Kanda means that first do Karma Yoga. And only when your mind now has become more subtle are you capable of becoming a shishya. Otherwise, you won't become a shishya. You'll be sitting there uh, taking notes, but it wouldn't mean anything to you. So yes, Karma Kanda, which is Dvaita, is important before Advaita. Yes. Thank you, Vijayji. Very clear. There is one more question. Uh, it is about, uh, it would be interesting to hear some snippets of the discussion or questions Shankara's students asked and Shankara's answers to them. Are there some insights on these discussions? Can you elaborate? You know, I'm afraid not. I have not seen any specific uh, discussions like that. And there are some historical facts. I'm sure that uh, if one is very interested in doing that, there may be some. But I think it's one very interesting thing. I tell you, this is part of the uh, Vedantic uh, uh, teaching. Mm -hmm. We do not require some external people to ask questions. Right. So the doubts are incorporated in the teaching itself. Mm -hmm. All the dialogue, if you look at Bhagavad Gita, you see, Arjuna was a great friend of Sri Krishna. They had been friends for a long time. Mm -hmm. They were very dear to each other. Krishna is the Lord. He's Ishwara. Yeah. If he was so dear to Arjuna, why could he not just lay his hand on his head and say, Om, you are done. He couldn't do it. Why? Because the own ahankara of the person has to be destroyed. Mm -hmm. So we kept arguing with him. And Arjuna keeps saying, Are you confusing me? Last chapter you told me this, that um, you know, karma is better. Then you say jnanam is better. I don't understand what you're saying. The whole dialogue goes on. In fact, in the I believe in the 13th chapter, he says, Krishna, can you please tell me what is Jnanam? Krishna must say, oh my God, I can't believe it. We have been doing this for so many years. So there's questions incorporated in that. So what I'm saying in answer to this, this uh, question is that in each of the um, uh, textbooks, you find doubts being created by the teacher itself. So this is what is called Purva Paksha and Siddhanta. Purva Paksha Siddhanta. Right. So the right. Purva Paksha might have been their own mind at one time. Mm -hmm. So from there you can postulate that this must have been the question for, from them. Yeah. That's wonderful. And uh, one more question we have. Actually, the comment it begins with, it says, your storytelling ability is brilliant. I could visualize young Hasta Malaka meeting his guru. <laughs> uh, to you. And then the question says, how much do we know about Gaudapada and Govindapada? Because, uh, you know, obviously the Mandukya Karika of Gaudapada is the one that made Shankara to get into the Advaita to a certain extent, people say. But we don't hear too much about... Govindapada and Gaudapada beyond that. 
are there some things which are uh, stories that are known about so i think uh, i think that comment is really good we don't really have um a lot of uh, specificity in terms of the people um the only thing that uh, i would may interject one thing yeah. uh, last yeah. year we have a, a project near indore um mm-hmm. where we are doing some chatralay for aim for seva and swami asharan and the, one of my guru bhais took me to uh, uh to the narmada river mm-hmm. where um, adi shankara studied mm-hmm. vedanta with his guru in a kind of like a cave like situation mm. and i took some pictures of that and uh, so there is some definiteness about the fact that this is where he came and so on and so forth yeah then it gets lost after that in terms of gaudapada acharya but the gaudapada acharya mm. is important for the essence of the karika so karika has four chapters mm-hmm. and i think it has um uh, like the one that we are currently doing is about 120 so maybe altogether 300 verses the 300 verses depict the thinking of the person mm-hmm. extremely advanced mm-hmm. and very very uh, tough tough in the sense that you know one of the things he says is that there is no such thing as a creation there is no real creation mm-hmm. vedas has been saying there is creation there is creation there is creation chitcha taitriya upanishad says it chandogya upanishad says it so on this is a very advanced view that in this is just like karmakanda in the beginning you have to understand there is creation it's kind of like you know we teach this that if you're if you're not strong enough to walk you may need to have some aid to walk and the aid to walk is that yes there is creation yeah. eventually when you become very strong gaudapada acharya says there is no creation mm-hmm. and so there the reason what i'm men- mentioning is we don't know a lot about him but his thinking yeah is absolutely amazing so that gives us an idea of who the person was yeah i can imagine it is thank you very much vijay ji it is uh, oh, really amazing welcome. how you brought in some stories of uh, his disciples and uh, about his teachers thank you for bringing us a very delightful and different kind of a talk that uh, enlightens the life of uh, shankara and his disciples Thank you, you so much for you saying that. I appreciate it, and I thank you for including me in this whole thing. Thank you. Hari Om. Thank you.